for any class in the Star Trek, it is interesting to try and do an analysis of them. For the Galaxy class, it is perhaps more than any other. To describe the Galaxy's class as evolution and variations as convoluted and complicated is to suggest that Roman history is straightforward. This is the world we must live in. The first thing which people often bring up is size of ship. They point out the galaxy class can't be cruisers because, well, they're converted into dreadnoughts. And let's be honest, a variation of a battle cruiser and aircraft ca and carriers for fighters. Wonderful points. Apart from it misses the fact that traditionally, especially as you go back to periods of exploration, cruisers when they were frigates, were often as big, if not bigger, than battleships. In fact, even in the 1920s and the 30s, when we look at a county class compared to the battleships in service at the time, there is a similarity in size. If not in displacement, a mass, there is a similarity in size. And this leads us to a point. Honestly, a battleship doesn't need to be as big as a cruiser, especially not something which is called an exploration cruiser. An exploration cruiser will need to have the armaments of a cruiser, but will also need to have all the capacities to do the scientific work, galactic analysis, all the studies and all the science teams, and especially if it's on a five-year mission a long way from home, it might well be taking families. That does seem to be the Federation way, which all requires space. And then you need space for dealing with whatever might come up. You always need more space. It's one of the few things you can never have enough of. And let's be honest, a spaceship is the ultimate demonstration of steel and air are cheap. Well, they are. Not having enough there when you get turns up is a bit of a problem. Especially if you are insisting on operating with solo exploration missions. We won't get into this too much, but to be honest, my view on solo exploration missions is pretty, pretty cynical. Now, to an extent, you can say the galaxy gets around us by having the saucer and the uh, main body separate. That's uh, certainly a methodology for getting around the problem of doing a solo ship exploration. Not sure I'm that keen on it, but uh, it's a methodology. The point is, the Galaxy class are cruisers. And I'm going to be going through this and explaining this in more detail as we get into this, but it's important to remember why they're cruisers, and why they are the size they are, and why they are the capabilities they are. We're talking about cruisers in space. If there is, and not leaving aside the science reasons, and the diplomatic reasons, and the, 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 the voyaging into the unknown reasons, there are many good reasons for a cruiser to be larger than a battleship in space. For example, any ship which is orientated around fighting in space will want to pack as much firepower into a small space as possible. It wants to maximize its maneuverability. Its ability to fight. Which, of course, is going to lead to an interesting discussion at some point. Is a Defiant class, a battleship, to the... Galaxy class cruiser. And sorry, no, it's not. I'll leave that one to the end and I'll discuss that at the end. But the Defiant is not the battleship. And honestly, really, truly, when you're looking through the pantheon of memory alpha stuff, the official canon, i.e., what's appeared on screen for Star Trek, there really hasn't been much in the way of battleships from the Federation. Now, this is interesting 
at normal points. During the Dominion War, this is frankly obscene. As is the, la the lack of detail given about the galaxy converted to carriers. But basically, the galaxy class fulfill all these roles. In, with their modifications. And this is the other advantage of having a cruiser build which has so much space for science and other things inside it. When the time comes, it has a lot of power generation, it has a lot of processing capability, and you can rip that stuff out and replace it. And that's exactly what they do do. Which actually makes it a very sensible build. This leads into the next point where we're talking about space in 24th century and especially the federation the federation are always portrayed as the good guys and usually they're portrayed as their goodness allowing other people to take advantage of them and to steal advance on them i'm sorry but in a world which has section 31 you have to start considering that but you also have to start considering whether or not there is another layer going on what is this other layer? Well, let's consider how quickly and how capably they do convert their galaxy class ships into dreadnoughts, into carriers. That suggests someone's been thinking about it for a little bit longer than five minutes. In fact, that considering where all the advances that the Federation do push through in terms of standardization across multiple classes and components so that they can implement them across multiple ships and multiple ship classes and they can swap bits out when they can for battle damage. There is a level of hiding capability in plain sight. Cloaked in the cover of an exploration cruiser, you have a very good ship design, which allows you a lot of capability to adapt it as you need to the circumstance. They produce ships which are capable of carrying a significant number of fighters. They produce ships which are capable of having a significant weapons upgrade. That's advantage. That's capability. Now, I know later on, Commodore Riker will turn up with the... Uh, <clears throat> Zheng He, and all those ships, and that's a slightly different breed. One of the interesting things was those were produced internally, and it made me think, well, there's no galaxies, there's no big sovereigns, there's nothing really ca massively overwhelmingly capable in that group, they're all the much, the much, the muchness. And that gives you another idea what potentially Star Trek, uh, the Federation has going on. Ships like the Galaxy class are their long-range exploration cruisers. But if you have an exploration cruiser, that suggests you also have maybe something you might call a security cruiser, or a patrol cruiser, or even a frigate. And the Zheng He and her fellow sisters start to make sense from that perspective. Because, yes, they can produce 150 of them, because they are now, I don't know... The souped up, more regular version of the Defiant. The Defiant didn't look quite Starfleet. The Defiant looked a bit too nasty. The Defiant looked a bit too violent. We need something that looks like one of our cruisers, but we can have it in large numbers, and we can turn them up in a massive fleet. And they are all about the fighting. Whereas, for an exploration cruiser, they need to look a little less mean. They need to be able to do the diplomacy. 
they're going to be this wonderful ship turning out of the blue, up out of the blue, to a freshly warp capable society and going, hello, welcome to the international intergalactic nationhood, civilizationhood. At least they're mature enough not to say, let's throw down your weapons. No, it's here. Let's join together and we can, you can have, if you join us, you can have access to ours. Which might explain why the Federation has so many rules about not giving weapons technology to anyone else. Their weapons technology, and their science technology, the really good stuff. It's just one of the many incentives for joining the Federation. You want answer, you want access to this really cool weapons tech. You want access to this really cool stuff, this wonderful shining ship you see before you. You want to have one of these ships at your disposal protecting you. And the only way you're going to get it is if you join us. So there you go. Behind the nice facade, the wonderful dream made real of the Federation, the galaxy class illustrates the reality of a real politic and the role of cruisers. They are powerful, they are potent. And they matter. But they're not about being soft. 